Hey everybody, this is round four of my playthrough of Rise of the Rune Lords Burnt Offerings in the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Sioni has just defeated a goblin raider in the town square and has managed to close that location, which means that so far we have found all three henchmen in this in, in this uh, round or in this in this scenario. We found a goblin raider, we found Suto uh, Kaijutsu, and another goblin raider. So there were only three henchmen and one villain. Through process of elimination, the villain is here at the city gate. Let's read up about the city gate real quick. Alert and capable guards hold their, their posts, questioning visitors and checking cargo at the fortified entry into their community. Between the guards stand strong gates and a sturdy portcullis. The wood and steel of these solid barriers showing scratches and scores acquired while defending against unwelcome strangers, would-be invaders, and worse. At this location, if, you, if you're in a combat check, uh, no, if you fail at a combat check, shuffle a random monster from the box into the location deck. So that could, this can get bad, this can get worse, is what that's saying to me. I'm not too terribly concerned, but but it is uh, something to consider. So, let's see. Um, this is Valeros. He's there. Uh, Sioni is not there yet. So he's at this location. And we need to flip a timer over. He's actually down a card. Because he took damage from uh, some fire damage from a goblin during Sioni's turn. Sioni's turn. So, um, that's kind of unfortunate, but, I mean, he's got weapons, he's got a blessing, which is pretty flexible, so we'll just see what happens. Goblin Commando. Okay, so this isn't, this isn't a henchman, this is just a normal old monster, and, um, it says, before the encounter, the goblin deals one ranged combat to you. Okay, so he's got to get rid of a card. I think, I think the, is, I, I honestly, I think that getting rid of the weapon, the, this dagger is going to be the way to go. Because this, this thing, um, at, uses his dexterity or ranged die, which for Valeros is only a d8, and it adds a d4. His other weapon adds a d8, so, and, and then he's using a d10 plus his plus three melee, so, I mean, there's, Really no reason for him to be fighting with a little dagger when he's got the long sword as an option. And the Blessings of the God is just... The, the Blessing of the Gods is a very flexible card. So it's better to hang on to that than a dagger. So that's what we'll... For, for the one point of damage, we've discarded a dagger. And now we can go into combat. The combat check to defeat this little guy is 9. Which... As usual, uh, it's going to be Valeros's D10 for strength, plus three, four, melee. I have no idea where a three is. There we go. Plus three for melee, and then finally a D8, because he has this long sword that he can reveal. He doesn't have to discard it or even recharge it. He just reveals it. So he got a four. That's a good start. Plus his three. So he's already at seven. He can still fail this if he rolls a one. Uh, that's an awkward... I hate it when that happens. But yeah, I guess that's a three. I think that's fair. I don't know. We could roll it again if we... Yeah, a four. So either way, like, we're looking at seven, ten, eleven, something like that to defeat a nine. That seems pretty good. But remember... This goblin card has the goblin trait on it, which means that we are bound to roll a d6, and if it comes up a 1, which is this logo here, then everyone takes one point of fire damage. We rolled a 2. That's lucky. I didn't really want to take any more uh, damage, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that result. So, let's see what's happening next. Um, I mean, we could discard a blessing to explore more, but, I mean, frankly, I'm just feeling so good about... This is our timer deck. These are the cards we 
the these are the possible locations of the villain. Those are one of these cards is the villain. So I feel really good about this. Um, so good, in fact, that I'm I'm almost thinking, as as crazy as it may seem, I'm thinking of sending Sioni back to an old location just so she can gain more cards. Um, it sounds a little bit weird to do that, but I mean, I, I really feel kind of like that might be the the way to go. So she he is he is drawing back up to his hand. He's got a short sword now. He's got a an ally, so that's pretty good. Um, and I'm 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 saying that I'm I'm going to split the party now because I kind of feel like once we find the villain, the way I've been playing, is that the game is immediately over. And the advantage to that is that if you're down to like zero cards in your draw deck, then when you defeat the villain by saying that it's over immediately then the character doesn't die because there's no need to then draw back up to your hand. Whereas if you say that the game continues after you draw the villain, after you defeat the villain, then there's the requirement to draw back up to your hand and then your character dies. And I think it's more exciting for this game if you're, if you're using up all your resources down to your last card and you find the villain. It just seems very anticlimactic to defeat the villain and then to fall down dead. I would prefer it to just you fall down unconscious and villagers come and and, and heal you rather than b both of you dying. So that's how I've been playing it personally. I don't know. The rule isn't super specific on that. Like, after you defeat the villain, is your do you still have to finish your turn? Like, is that how it's... Is, is that how it happens? It just seems weird to me because then you'd always have to you'd always have to be able to defeat the villain within a certain threshold of your draw deck, and I feel like it makes more sense in a card game for your whole draw deck to be useful for you. There shouldn't be like three cards at the bottom of your draw deck that you're just never able to use. So that's my logic anyway. So I don't know. I think I'm gonna I think I'm I'm gonna do it. And the the advantage here, first of all, it's in the rules that even after a location is closed, you're allowed to go back to it and continue to explore. So that's that's fine. And the advantage to her is that if there are some cards in here that that she didn't get in her initial deck, then at the end of this game, between this game and the next game, I'm allowed to trade cards, you know, uh, swap out maybe some basic cards for some better ones that she has found. So this is part of the deck building process, really. And who doesn't like to explore? Um, possibly her, because she has only got three cards, none of which are attack spells. So, I mean, this is kind of a dangerous game, but she's got this cool spell, Invisibility. So if she encounters something that's a little bit too much, she can cast Invisibility, discard this spell, which of course for her actually just means recharge it, and then she doesn't have to fight that, that monster. She just evades it. We put the monster back in the location deck and, and nothing comes of it. And she's down so low because she took damage after a turn or something. I don't know, maybe I forgot to draw back up to her hand size. But it's too late for me to remember or fix that now. So I'm just going to continue on. So she goes to the cathedral. We turn over a timer deck card. And she explores. And she finds mirror image. This is exactly why I wanted to explore. Uh, not this card specifically, but this, this occurrence. This is a spell that she would not have access to otherwise. It's not a basic spell. It's a new spell that she can acquire if she does an arcane check, if she succeeds on an arcane check. Her arcane die is a d12. She has a plus two for her arcane skill, and so I can roll it. She gets a seven, eight, nine. She only needed a six to acquire. She has now got that spell in her hand, which is great. If you are dealt damage by a monster during your turn, you may discard this card to roll a d4, and on a result other than 1, reduce the damage to 0. Roll again for each additional source of damage. So that can be, I mean, that'll be great. I mean, yeah, it's more armor, and she's got loads of armor. So much, in fact, that I even wonder if maybe, maybe it would be useful for her to give 
Valeros, the Bracers of Protection or something. But they are rechargeable, which I do like. But anyway, so she's that's pretty good. That's pretty exciting. She can't do anything else, really, without discarding. And I don't want to discard. That's not the point of sending her to the Sandpoint Cathedral. So she's going to draw two more. She's got a Blast Stone. I hate these things. They're, you have to banish the card to add a D4 to your combat which I don't really feel is a D4 for losing a card forever. It just doesn't seem all that useful. And then she's got a new ally in her hand. So that's pretty good. I might discard that ally. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I can't right now because that was the end of her turn. Back over to Valeros. He's going to turn over a card, uh, a timer card. And is he going to travel up to her and explore the Sandpoint Cathedral as well? Would that be a thing to do? Because if he turns over the villain, then we've triggered the end game. That's my concern. So, yeah, I think he's going to go up and help her explore. And he's got a full hand, right? Yeah, he does. Uh, so, yeah, I think he'll just explore here. Holy candle. Well, this is a great reason for him not to be exploring here. I forgot that there's so much spell stuff here. Although, to be fair, Sioni would fail at this as well. So this requires a uh, Wisdom or Divine check of 10. And neither of them have great Wisdom. In fact, he, he has Wisdom so low that he could not possibly get a 10. I think under any circumstance. Yeah, his is a D4, his Wisdom. So even if I doubled his roll, a D4 and a D4 with the blessings of, a blessing of the God, God's, that would not get him up to being able to do a d10. So that's just gone. Gone. And we'll tick over a timer card. Sioni's turn now, so she will explore. Blessings of the gods, she automatically acquires the blessings of the gods. So that's a good thing to have, because that also means... I mean, she has to discard something now. And as always, why discard something without any benefit. So rather than reaching the end of her turn and having to discard a card, I'm going to choose to discard this Troubadour so that we can explore uh, explore the location. Now this actually, oh wait, you know what? I might not do that because I think I know, I'll bet I know what card that is. No, I don't. All right, back to it. I thought it was a barrier, and barriers are a pain. Oh, this is, this could be, no, this is, this is not good. This is bad for Sioni. This is not good for Sioni. So this is a war chanter. Explore, uh, before the encounter succeeded, a wisdom eight check, or the, or you may not spell, uh, play spells with the attack. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, no, it does matter. Okay, so she needs to succeed at a Wisdom 8. I have a feeling we're taking damage, unfortunately. But, you know, this is what we've been doing. This is the risk we've had. So she needs to do a Wisdom. What am I looking through there for? Wisdom is a D6. And this is telling her that she needs a Wisdom 8. So that's not going to work out for her. Unless she plays a Blessing of the Gods. Or does she have anything else to help her with this? No. She could evade. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So she's going to cast Invisibility. Of course, she's got a special trait that says when you have to discard a card, uh, a spell, you can automatically succeed at the recharge check instead. So I'm putting that back at the bottom of her deck. And that means she doesn't have to fight this thing. Well, luckily, Valeros is at this location. He can fight the thing. So he's going to take out his usual D10 plus a 3 bonus for melee. And he's going to reveal his longsword. Yep, his longsword, which get, grants him a D8 bonus. So that's that D8. So 3... What is this? We're looking for an 8 total. He doesn't have to do the wisdom check because he's not casting a spell. So that it doesn't, whether he succeeds or fails, doesn't matter. I mean, he would fail, um, but it doesn't really matter. 
So that's an 8 to defeat the goblin. We've got a plus 3, so technically we're really only just trying to get a 5 between these two die. On his d8, he rolls a 4, so, I mean, even if he rolls a 1 on his d10, he still succeeds. He rolled a 6, so he absolutely slaughters this guy. But there's this pesky little damage die because this goblin war chanter is unsurprisingly uh, some a card with the goblin trait on it. And because we're still in burnt offerings, uh, whenever we defeat a goblin, we have to roll a d6. And if it's if we get a one, we have to take one point of damage. So if we roll a one, take damage. That was one. Darn. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, we'll just get rid of the short sword, because once again, why why hold on to a short sword when you have a long sword? And then for Sioni, who I forgot to draw back up to six at the end of her turn, uh, we can get rid of, I guess... Okay, so there's um, Bracers of Protection, Arcane Armor, and Mirror Image are all armor, armor spells. And the weakest of them all is Bracers. So I'm going to get rid of Bracers as her damage. Because she's got Arcane Armor and uh, Mirror Image if she really needs to reduce damage. Wait a minute. That's stupid. Why would I do that? Let's instead recharge her Bracers <laughs> to reduce the damage dealt by one. Well, she only got one point of fire damage. Her bracers of protection. She holds them up, Wonder Woman style, to block the um, to block the fire damage. Okay, so that's good. Now the cathedral is well and truly closed. I mean, there's n nothing left. Now, if I wanted to be brazen, I could go back to the town square to try to gain g get more cards, or I could go back to the Swallowtail Festival to try to get more cards. Uh, my, I guess my concern with that idea is, you know, that eventually I am going to start feeling pressure um, to get through my timer, you know, as my timer deck depletes. Uh, and there are still quite a few cards here. Uh, and it is dangerous to explore. So what am I going to choose to do? Let's go to the city gate and let let fate decide. So Valerius will go to the city gate because it's his turn. And I'll turn over a timer deck card and we'll explore. And of course, Sioni is not there, so that's something to keep in mind. So we're at the city gate. He's going to explore and he turns over a potion of ghostly form. And for this, he's going to need to do an intelligence or craft spell of four. His intelligence, I think, is a d6. Yeah, it's a d6. So there's a chance he could get that, but not a great chance. So he rolled a three, so that that's gone. I just, I hate that I keep getting these potential cards that are then uh, wasted because because poor little Valeros over here, poor big Valeros, can't seem to do the, the the arcane or intelligence checks required. So I think I'm going to once again split the party and send Sioni back to the F Swallowtail Festival, which has been closed. But um, it just seems like a thing to do. So I'm going to send her back over there. We're splitting the party. It's not an RPG, so splitting the party isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. The The disadvantage is that Valeros is not co-located with her, which means that she cannot take his additional d4 to her combat. Also a, of concern is she doesn't really have a combat spell right now. Her one combat spell is Force Missile, and she's had to recharge it, so it's somewhere very near the bottom of her of her deck. So it, it is a dangerous game that I'm playing right now, but there she does have this Blast Stone, which is a single-use bonus D4, so it's like having Valeros around. It's just, unfortunately, 
in order for her to be able to cast a combat spell, she's going to have to discard something. And she's down a card right now because she took, um, she had to recharge the Bracers of Protection to prevent her from taking damage. Okay, did I turn over a timer card for her yet? Well, I don't remember, so I guess I'm going to turn it over. That's too bad. I wish I'd keep track of that sort of thing better. Okay, so she's exploring. It is an ally. Allies are a charisma check. Well, this particular ally, I believe, is a charisma diplomacy check. Her charisma die is a d12. Her diplomacy gets her a plus two. She rolled a nine, so she acquires this card into her hand. So she's got three things now. So this does a non-combat strength or constitution. This ally does a recharge to add to survival. Well, I guess I'll just discard the standard bearer to explore some more. Flaming Mace. That's cool. This could this would be a lot better for Valeros, unfortunately. Um, okay, Strength Melee 11. There's absolutely no way. Wait, is there no way? Oh, I just, I just discarded the way. Yep, that Standard Bearer could have helped her with an Arcane, with a Strength check. Um, I could discard this, but even then, her Strength is just a D4. So, a D4 on top of... A d4. I mean, there's no way she can get 11. So, just the same way that Valeros wastes all of her potential spell cards that we get, um, she's wasting an armor, a, a weapon card that would have been really cool for for Valeros to have. Okay, so we've drawn back up to six for Sioni, uh, and then we're gonna flip over a timer card for Valeros. And actually, I think I'm going to send him up to join Sioni. And I'm, I keep doing this because the villain is definitely in this deck. The minute we defeat the villain, the game is over. So I want to build up their decks for future. So he is going to he's going to draw, and it is a Goblin Pyro. This he's the perfect one to to do this. This is good. This is okay. There's going to be one fire damage automatically from this and then of course potentially another one because it's a goblin trait so either way we're taking damage that's too bad but this is valeros he's got a d10 he's got his plus three for melee put that there and a d8 for his long sword so that's six right off right off the bat so unless he rolls a one on his d10 he succeeds. He succeeds with a 7 plus 6. So he slaughters the goblin. Do we take damage? No. Well, yes, but not because of that. So the goblin trait fire damage does not trigger. But there is a unconditional thing on this card that says one fire damage after defeating this thing. So everyone gets to discard one card. I think that Sioni is going to discard this guide, maybe? Why not? And Valeros will discard his standard bearer. Why not? It's the end of Valeros' turn, so we're going to draw back up to four, and now he has some armor, which is exactly what I wanted. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? Sioni is not going to discard a guide. She is going to cast um, Arcane Armor. She can discard that to reduce damage dealt. Yeah, because look, Sioni's discard deck is down to three cards, so I'm really nervous about her health. So it actually almost benefits her, really, to recharge her Arcane Armor. So now she's got one more in her in her deck and zero damage so the recharges are 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 huge for Sioni like that's it's really really significant so that was Valeros's turn so now it's Sioni's turn we're going to flip over a card from the timer deck 
and Sioni is going to explore. This is a blessing of Lamashtu. Uh, this is an arcane check. Five. Well, her arcane, of course, is her strongest trait. Uh, she rolled a nine, plus she's got a bonus, so she definitely gets this blessing back into her hand, which is great because now she's got a full hand, so she doesn't even have to draw from her, her from her draw deck, which which is great. That that's that means that you know the, the, that timer element is is not as big of a deal, and this is exactly why I'm exploring further because because of that it's important to to keep those cards in her in her draw deck. Uh well, that was her turn and I'm just going to I'm monitoring the size of that timer deck, comparing it to the city gates. There's only three more cards here. I happen to know that one of these is going to be a barrier, at least one of them. So, I don't know how much how much of an advantage this really is giving us at this point. Especially since the villain, for all we know, could be way down at the bottom of this deck. So I feel like I'm gonna cut cut my losses a little bit there and just send we and trigger trigger the end game as, as 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 soon as I can, pretty much. So yeah. I think closed locations are now I'm just gonna treat them as truly, truly closed. And I'm going to send Valeros and when it's her turn, Sioni, down to the city gate to try to end this thing. Uh, so Valeros, timer card, explore. Well, there's the villain. Um, that happened a lot sooner than I thought. I mean, I figured it had to happen at some point, but that's funny. Okay, so before this encounter succeeded a stealth 9, or the difficulty to defeat Rip Nugget is increased by two. As far as I know, he doesn't have anything to help him with stealth. And he has no stealth skill on his list. I mean, I, I guess it's derived from dexterity, as in the RPG. But, yeah, I don't... So I think he auto-fails that. So the in difficulty to defeat Rip Nugget specifically is increased by two, so that makes it a 12. Stickfoot is the first combat that we need to go into, and he needs a 9. Well, I feel pretty good about this. This is Valeros. He's got two forms of armor that he'll be able to use, and a longsword. His longsword gets him that d8 bonus. He's already got a plus 3 because of his arcane uh, bonus, so he's trying to get a 9 between a d10 and a d8. It, things could go wrong, for sure. But we'll see what happens. So three automatically. So really he's getting, he's trying for a six between these two die. So he just rolled an eight on his d8. That's the longsword die. So he's he's defeated Stickfoot. Okay, so now we reset. And we go over to Rip Nugget. Rip Nugget says 12, but of course we failed the stealth check, so actually it's, uh, rather, it says 10, yeah, but it's actually a 12, because we failed the stealth check, so it gets a plus 2 bonus. So a 12. Once again, reveal the longsword for the d8, plus the 3 bonus for, for melee, and so that brings that down to a 9... We need a 9 between a D8 and a D10. That's going to be trickier. Is there anything we can do to ensure our success? Well, we do have a blessing, blessing of the God. And if we discard this card, we can add one die to a check. Now, I don't know how this works because it says add one die. Do I just get to choose the die? I don't know. The way that I've always thought of it is essentially... It's it's the die that you're rolling, you add another one of those. So in other words, instead of 1d10, he gets 2d10. Then he reveals his longsword and adds a d8. That's how I'm ruling it. I don't know if that's correct, but the rules aren't super explicit about what the term add one die to a check actually means. But that's how I play it throughout. So this is being consistent with my interpretation. 
So two D10 and a D8 plus a three. Well, yeah, so the three we can forget. So if we're shooting for a nine because of that three bonus that subtracts from 12, uh, shooting for a nine across all of these, that, that feels pretty good. That's a six. That's a 10. And that's an eight. So yes, we we beat Rip Nugget. We beat Stickfoot. And we've defeated the villain. So we've won the game. The way that I've been playing it so far in the past is that when when you defeat the villain, the game is immediately over. I mean, I realize that technically we're supposed to roll one damage for because it's the goblin trait. So we could roll a d6, I guess, just to see if we take a damage. Four, so we don't take damage. And either way, I've just been playing it such that that's the end of the game because I find it kind of disheartening to just discard cards, you know, when you're after you win. So um, that's it. That's that's round one. That is, or that's round. That's scenario one. That is attack on sandpoint completed. So when you complete this, it says each character gains a skill feat. A skill feat is one of the little benefits listed under skills on the character card, which means that I'll be able to go through here and decide which of his attributes gets a free plus one to it and i'll have to i'll have to think about what i want to do like do i want to boost what he's already good at like he's got a d10 in his strength should i just add that so that he gets a free plus one or should i raise up his lowest attribute which is wisdom up to like a d4 plus one i don't know i'll have to think about it same goes for sioni so that's that's scenario one done next up according to burnt offerings uh, adventure is local heroes so i will start that next time thanks for watching